Good evening and welcome to this NET Exploring English podcast. I'm Mr Craven from the NET English Director team and today I'm going to be talking through the poem Tissue by Imtiat Starka. Let's start with the poet. Now Imtiat Starka was born in Pakistan in 1954 but she was raised in Glasgow, spending some of her time also in London and Wales. Now Darker is an artist and documentary maker as well as a poet, uh, with common themes in all aspects of her work, including childhood, divisions, connections, perception and conflicts. The extent to which this is relevant to the poem, in terms of the context, is debatable. After all, there's no geographical specificity to the poem, despite this culturally specific reference to a Quran. In many ways, to overly contextualise the poem in terms of external context we're bringing to it is to miss, I think, the point that Dark is making. The poem is, after all, about universal ideas and themes, rather than specific. It's about people, it's about the past, and it's about the importance of physicality and immediacy. And those aren't culturally, geographically, or temporally limited. Now, the metaphor and the central tension of the poem are both expressed through the title. Here, tissue refers both to the, the thinned paper that forms the central motif that runs throughout the poem, and also to human tissue in the sense of the body. In terms of the form and structure of the poem, it consists of these nine quatrains, these four line stanzas, followed by a single line stanza at the end that acts almost like a, like a conclusion. The stanzas act as almost self enclosed moments, they're pieces of text, with stanzas two to seven describing uses for paper and stanzas 9 and 10, making the link then from paper to the human body. It's almost as if assembling all the pieces of life in the stanzas, the records, the maps, the receipts, that, that if we assemble these fragments in order to trace the life, to look at the person behind it, to try and make contact with them, it leads us to the final realisation that people are more valuable, more, more complex and more temporary than an object or a text could ever be. Hence that single line conclusion. Now lines throughout the poem are erratic in their length, and there's no sense of a rhyme scheme, though there is some alliteration in lines such as layer over layer luminous, and the marks that rivers make, roads and rail tracks. The frequent enjambments azuras, coupled with this, create this free-flowing conversational, or almost meditative tone, rather than one that's strictly defined and controlled. The students often find the poem quite challenging due to the non-narrative structure. Where we have a story, such as in Remains or My Last Duchess, it's easier to engage with characters, with events and with systems. Where that's lacking, such as in Checking Out My History and Tissue, it's harder to situate aspects within the poem and to engage with a causal or a meaningful structural process to it. Now remember, the best way to view this poem is as a series of snapshots, as fragments, a bit like the, the photograph idea in War Photographer. Now, the poem is written seemingly in the third person, in terms of perspective, though there are hints of personal involvement through the reference to I might in stanza four and our lives in stanza six. We also shift from the general to the intimately specific in the end of the poem, where the temporary structure never meant to last, made of paper smoothed and stroked and thinned to be transparent, becomes your skin. A fragile, transient human life, defined by physical intimacy and potentially by bodily affection. Now, The opening image of the poem, the paper that lets the light shine through, sets up this central metaphor already signposted by the title. Here, the paper that could alter things is the paper that's been used, that's been shown affection, reverence, utility or importance. It's because these kinds of paper are literally thinner, like tissue, since they've been well used, but also because these kinds of text are most revealing in terms of seeing the people behind them and through them. The paper becomes literally slightly transparent because it's so thin, but we also see truth through the paper, both in terms of the information it contains and the experiences the values that it shows us in terms of the people who, inter who interacted with it. There's also the sense in which the poem implies that time brings wisdom, or at least experience, but that even ageing skin is intended for human interaction. Now often light is linked in writing like this as an image to religion, the light of God and so on. 
But this doesn't seem a natural fit here. The light doesn't seem divinely directed. In actual fact, it's human interactions that seem far more meaningful than religious ones. And it's very noticeable that Darker treats the Quran here as almost a biographical tract rather than something worthy of religious reverence. The text, she seems to suggest, has value as a historical and personal record. It's defined and given value solely through its interactions with people. Notice also that Darker refers to this paper's ability to alter things. Yes, the power of information and understanding provided by text, but also investing the paper with a symbolic power in terms of providing insight into lived experience. The idea of age and touching also sets up the running motif of the human body throughout the poem. Much like the pieces of text, the interactions with people are anonymous. It was a hand that wrote the names and histories, not a specific individual or a named person. It's a, this anonymous figure from a past that it's impossible to fully know or to fully engage with and understand. In the second stanza, do notice the semantic field of measurement and information. Names, histories, and then height and weight in the third stanza. Now, Darker deliberately juxtaposes this impersonal and distanced data with a tactile intimacy, again, of the smoothed and stroked and turned pages, conveying both the value of the information and, through it, the even more vital importance of those figures who interacted with it. Notice also how the uses to which paper is put link to often significant moments in human lives, to histories, to births, to deaths, to journeys, and so on. Now, for darker, for much like life, much like paper, all things are ephemeral. If buildings were made of paper, we could see their drift, how they fall away on a sigh. But our limited lifespans and our perspective of time prevent us from seeing this. Even here, interactions are personified with their drift and the wind compared to a sigh, carrying a sense of regret and sadness at time passing and loss, but also the, the inevitability of time and nature with the changing of the direction of the wind. Nature, it seems, will outlast all things, but Darker also allows an association of nature with human experience, offering hope, perhaps, that human experience itself is also something lasting in a broader sense. The maps in the fourth stanza provide an interesting image. Here, the sun shines through their border lines, suggesting that borders themselves allow access to truth or clarity. After all, some of these borders are natural, they're physical and definite rivers, mountains. The rivers deepen and change their course over time, and mountains are worn away. Other borders are physical, but imposed by people, roads, railway tracks. Still more are arbitrary and defined entirely by history, where countries and counties begin and end, and so on. In this sense, boundaries also offer a glimpse into the past, revealed by the light, there's a parallel, clearly, between nature writing her history on the landscape as a whole and humans writing on paper. Just as paper is linked to the human body, it can also be linked to the skin and body of the earth itself. Now, the receipts that Darker references in the sixth stanza act as fixed points. A receipt says where a person was at that time, how much they spent, what they bought. It's a snapshot of a moment in time, however limited, with its variability and its transience reinforced by the simile of the paper kites, something beautiful and seemingly offering definition and direction, but also distant, elusive, difficult to control, constantly trying to escape. However, the receipts act just as the records, the maps do, the records of moments, of, of lived human experiences. The reference to the architect in the seventh stanza offers perhaps a more effective image for God, a being capable of tracing the entirety of a life, constructing it piece by piece, following a grand design, in layering up text by text, until appreciating properly the preciousness and the complex beauty of a life. This links to the, the fragments of text that she describes, layers and pieces, records and details, all of which are used to trace a life and yet are unable to fully represent or reflect the profundity of lived experience. 
instead building from experiences and memories. The light of clarity and understanding can break through capitals and monoliths, with capitals referring to the disintegration of power from the centre, the almost Ozymandias-like toppling of symbols of authoritarian control and dominance, but also the capitalization of letters, the importance of words and names, and the lasting legacy that they have on a page. Again, the world is text, and text is the world. It's clear that Darker intends us to view these great symbols negatively. These are shaped and made by pride. They're marks on the landscape like those left by the river, but needing to be demolished and brought low since they represent and reflect not the transient beauty of time and life and experience, but human arrogance, an attempt at permanency, pride, hubris. Instead, Darker seems to be, suge be suggesting the grandest designs are crafted from living tissue, creating a structure never meant to last. Instead, the paper, and notice the shift from literal paper to paper as a metaphor, a tactile communicative medium. And the body it metaphorically represents, these things are both temporary, they're fragile and they're vulnerable, but they're all the more worthy of respect and reverence and appreciation of their beauty because of it. Here, the purest, the most perfect form of this is paper that could alter things, that lets the light shine through. And that's, at the end of the poem, skin. Fragile, beautiful, profound, recording lived experience and human contact. And if religion is a thread that runs through the poem in the background, then Darker seems to be strongly suggesting that the most effective source of light, the best way to engage with and understand it, and possibly with, with, a, with a God figure, is through physical human interaction, is through people, to be smoothed and stroked and thinned until truth can be revealed, transparent enough to see reality, but also, and most importantly, transforming into your skin. What Darker seems to be saying at the end of the poem is that all of these fragments, these pieces, these shapes, are used as access points to understanding people, but that all the records in the world are less effective than physically engaging with the human body, with a person, with a shift from the more impersonal and objectified engagement with books and paper to the intimate reference to your skin in the final line. And why is that then a single, solitary line? It was because, after all the confusion and the record keeping and the busyness and range of texts and information, these fragments, the most fundamental truth, the most cohesive reality, is also the simplest and quite possibly the shortest lived. Now, in terms of comparisons, it's worth thinking about the thematic and image overlaps with poems such as The Emigre, and the structural similarities with Checking Out My History and War Photographer, although other poems could also work. Right, that's it for now. Thanks for listening, and if you have any questions, queries or comments, please do talk to your English teacher or to one of the NET English director team.